All right, good evening. It is such an honor to be with you. And I got to say the same about Pastor Clint. When I met him, I thought, I aspire to be that good looking when I'm his age. That was the first thing I thought. And then I thought, this is a kindred heart, a kindred spirit. The more we've connected with your church over the last number of months, I thought, this is family. Your passion for prayer, your passion for mission, your passion for discipleship and local church. Guys, this is a remarkable community. Feeling the faith in the room tonight as we worship. I am so excited about what God's doing here and what he's doing in your region. And uh, the sand, I'm gonna share very briefly just so that we can give as much time as possible to Francis. But the sand was really started with a simple word from the Lord. And that word was that a massive sending movement was coming to America. And the sending movement not being limited to America, but to the globe, but that the greatest days of harvest were still ahead of us. The greatest spiritual awakening for our nation were still ahead of us. And I know I'm in good company when I say that. I know you believe and you carry the same conviction in your heart that the headlines don't have the corner on the kingdom of God. God is moving in amazing ways and he is looking for a church who will lift their eyes to him and believe that the harvest is ripe and to live like the harvest is ripe. The sin was based on this simple word and then we began to walk forward with a simple vision. The vision was to see 200,000 new missionaries launched into the nations of the earth. 7,000 remaining, uh, remaining unreached people groups. How many believe it would be of God's heart that the very term unreached would cease to exist after this generation? Believe in all of our hearts that this sending movement is upon us, that there is a generation alive right now that is zealous to go anywhere in the world for the sake of the gospel. But we also believe that God is calling us to the re-evangelization of our own nations. Believe that every high school in America is a mission field. Every university in America is a mission field. Believe that God is calling the church to activate into foster care and adoption like perhaps no generation in human history. We We've been praying, God, make young millennials and Gen Z the most adoptive generation in history who would take on the marginalized children of the world that the Lord would set the lonely in families. So this vision gripped us. 2019, we went after our first stadium gathering in Orlando, Florida. 60,000 people, largely young adults, gathered, and thousands and thousands made commitments to the nations to reach their high schools, their universities, foster care and adoption, all of these mission fields. We were stunned by what God did. Right after Orlando, the Lord spoke clearly to us to go to Brazil. For Orlando was remarkable, God took things supernova when we went to Brazil. We rented a stadium, it filled to capacity in six hours, eight months before the event, so we rented a second stadium, it filled over the weekend, so we rented a third stadium, and uh, in early 2020, we gathered 150,000 Brazilians in three stadiums. And I need you to know tonight, that was not because of marketing, that was not because of some well-known speaker or some great band, that's because God is moving on the earth. And he is jealous for the Great Commission to be the center of the conversation of global Christianity. And I believe he's doing it. 100,000 missional commitments were made in Brazil. The average age of those that gathered was 24 years old, and we believe that out of Brazil, a massive missions movement is rising that will not only touch the nation, the continent, but the nations of the earth. On this journey, the Lord spoke to us and said that the next location in America would be Kansas City, that all arrows were pointed to Arrowhead Stadium. And so 11 months from now, in early June 2022, we will be gathering in Arrowhead Stadium because we believe that God's eyes are on this region right now. And that the eyes of the nation and the eyes of the world are going to gather here in Kansas City for something that would be so loud, a sound of go so loud that the whole world would have to hear it. When I walked into Arrowhead Stadium the first time getting a tour, I saw this sign that boasted that the loudest human decibel that had ever been recorded was recorded in Arrowhead Stadium. And I felt the Lord say, wouldn't it be like me to break the record for the loudest sound that has ever been recorded in human history? And it wouldn't be for a touchdown, but it would be for Jesus, a great awakening and the great commissioning. 
I believe that's the hour we're in. So we want to invite you to join us. We have come to serve this city. We've come to build friendship and family. We don't want to be an event that just shows up and then disappears. We want to walk in relationship and believe that what happens in Arrowhead Stadium would touch Kansas City and that it would activate and mobilize Kansas City to touch the ends of the earth. But I just want to say is um, we really want to honor um, we really want to honor Pastor Clint. We really want to honor the pastors of this city, and we really want to honor you as the believers that have tilled the ground here for many many years. And we recognize and be the first to say we're not coming bringing anything. God's doing something here, and we want to join it. We want to serve it, and we want to see it touch the nations of the earth. So you can register at the send.org. You can pre-register there. But um, we have an amazing night here. We've already had an amazing night. And uh, many of you know uh, Francis Chan, doesn't need much of an introduction, but uh, it's been a remarkable uh, several year journey where we've really had the privilege of growing in deep friendship. And uh, Francis is one of those guys that uh, was a hero for many years, and you don't really ever think your heroes will become your friends. And then sometimes when your heroes do become your friends, they're not quite the hero that you thought they were. But I have to say that Francis was absolutely the opposite, that the more that I got to know Francis, the more amazed I was by his humility, his character, his radical obedience to Jesus. And uh, we're so privileged to be running this road together, to be journeying together. And so I'd love it if you just welcome Welcome Francis as he comes to share with us tonight. You guys, I am so full right now. Um, God has been doing some crazy things over the last three days. I I'm serious. Okay, I'm not exaggerating. I don't know what is going on in Kansas City, okay? I know we're doing the Send event. I know we're, it, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Kansas City. But I'm telling you, I've been walking with Jesus for 40 years now, okay? I, I fell in love with Jesus when I was in high school. And uh, I've been walking with him for 40 years. And studying this book almost every single day, okay, for 40 years and teaching out of this book, I don't know how many thousands of times. And for my entire Christian life, there's always been like this, I don't get it, like I, I see this power, I see this radical like God and, and everything that should happen and everything that did happen in the Old Testament, things that happened in the New Testament, things he promises for this age. And, and I, every once in a while I get glimpses of it. I, I see some here, here, here. And it's been growing, growing, growing. But there's always been like this gap between this book and what I experience in church, in conferences, in mission trips, wherever I went. These last three days, it's the first time when everything has come together in my life. You guys, I, I've been freaking out <laughs> seriously these last couple of days because I'm going I've never experienced anything like this like all day long and there is no way I can communicate in 30 minutes everything God has done and these last couple of days, and what I believe he's doing right now, based in Kansas City, it seriously is freaking me out. You guys, it's... And I'm praying over there during worship, and this is the first time I've prayed this before. Coming up, I'm just going, God, with everything I experienced these last few days, could it be possible that I walk up on that stage so believing that your Holy Spirit is with me and that the resurrected Christ is right here with me and that I am abiding in him? 
could it possibly be that you would bless me with a spiritual gift on that stage that I've never had, that I don't even know what it would be. And I walked up here nervous, a little bit scared because I'm going, God, I'm not scared to get in front of a crowd. I'm not scared that, oh, people might not like me or they, it's not that. I'm, I'm scared that I'm gonna come up here and preach some sermon from the past and just kind of do what I always do. Not always, I say what I often do. And go back to what's comfortable to me because God has been doing a new work in my life and I'm going, God, I don't wanna revert back. And it's so Scary. This is what I was nervous about when I get in front of a crowd, which is almost every day of my life. There's something that can click off and I'll start being concerned about what you think, giving you a good experience, giving you a good message where you walk away and go, oh, that was good. Rather than truly abiding in Christ and going, God, I want to be filled by your spirit every second. I want to be abiding in you every second. I want to be courageous enough to say anything you want to come out of this mouth, whatever. If everyone hates me, so be it. Come what may, right? Didn't we just sing that? I will obey. I'm just, I just want that. And I'm, I'm going, God, don't. Please don't let me go back. Don't let me just go back to what I know will work. Because I know I can give a message that'll get you leaving this room and go, oh, that was good, whatever. <laughs> but my fear is that would happen tonight and you walk out experience Francis Chan's preaching rather than truly experiencing the Holy Spirit of God. And I was, I was thinking about this verse, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where this, this was hitting me during worship, actually while Andy was speaking, I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying. It, it said uh, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, it says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So there's a warning here where he's saying, okay, God didn't send me to baptize so you can say, oh, I was baptized by Paul. He sent me to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And God was showing me, if you go back to an illustration you know will work, or a story you know will grip their hearts, and you use your eloquent speech, he goes, you're gonna empty the power of the cross. So don't revert back to that. This is, this is what he says later in, in, in chapter two, in verse one. He says, I, when I came to you brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of 
the Spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. So if I give some speech here that talks you into following Jesus because I timed it all out right and ended with the right story and changed the inflection of my voice and just just nailed it, nailed it, nailed it and talked you into something, then some other guy, as you walk out the door, or some, some college professor will give another equally eloquent speech with probably more intelligence and talk you right out of what I said because your conversion or supposed conversion was something I talked you into by my own intellect. And it was born... Paul says in that way on the wisdom of men and not the power of God. But if I could be connected with the Spirit of God tonight, today, sorry for those of you watching on Sunday, I blew it. I'm not supposed to do that. Okay, today. Um, see, I'm not eloquent. This is good. Uh, okay. But if today I could truly be possessed by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, like God from heaven today, literally does something and changes your heart, you can't be swayed by another human being. Something of God will be born inside of you where I don't care who tries to talk you out of it. They can't. Like something happened to me in high school. And no matter what the enemy or the world tried to convince me of, it didn't work. It hasn't worked for 40 years. Why? Because it wasn't some youth pastor. It was through a youth pastor but it really wasn't him. Something was born in me and got rooted in me. And so I couldn't walk away from it. it. Was The Bible says when the Holy Spirit enters in you, then you become a slave to righteousness. And so suddenly it's like, he didn't even have to tell me to walk away from my sin. Every time I started gravitating toward it, I just felt dirty and I couldn't live with myself because God did something in me. You know, in 2 Peter 2, it talks about how, how uh, a dog returns to its vomit and a pig, you, you can wash him off, but after he's, he's been washed off, he'll just run back to the mud. I, I've actually seen that happen you know, even though I live in the city, I, I saw one guy in one city far away who had a pig, and he washed it off, and the moment it was clean, it started running for the mud, and he, he literally, the big guy, like, tackled his pig, you know? And, I mean, you guys probably all have pigs, but uh, <laughs> it, it, some of you probably do, okay. But it, it was the first time I saw him, I'm like, whoa, they really do that. They really can't stand being clean. At least his couldn't. I was like, well, that's just like that passage says. Like, and what happens in the church a lot of times is we, we spray you off through eloquent speech. I've done it so many times through a great story or whatever else. And then we try to keep you clean with accountability groups and partners that are, with spray bottles to keep you clean. And the moment that week they don't give you a call, what do you do? You run back to the mud. Why? Why does a pig run back to the mud? Because it's a pig. It's what they do. But what the Holy Spirit does is he can actually change your nature. Where in the inside, you're no longer a pig. 
In fact, something changed and you go, I don't like mud anymore. I, like, I see it, and, 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 and there's this temptation sometimes, but the moment my feet get a little bit muddy, I go, I don't know why I can't stand this anymore. Because something was born of the Spirit. It was a demonstration of the Spirit's power that no human being can now take you away from. And so I'm praying, I'm going, God... I don't want to speak in the flesh ever again. I want to talk in the power of the Spirit and tell you that I fell in love with Jesus 40 years ago and it changed my life. I'm not saying it's been perfect. I'm not saying I haven't gotten my feet muddied. But I'm telling you, whenever I do, it grosses me out. It feels dark. It just, there's no peace. And I've got to get out and clean myself off. Because I'm a slave to righteousness. Because something happened inside. And I can't create that. I can't make that happen. And that's why I pray, I go, God, I don't know what you want to say or do in this room today. Um, but uh, yeah, and with everyone watching from wherever, I don't know you, you don't know me. Oh God, right now I pray. Pray that you continue to guide my lips to say what you want me to say. But more importantly, for everyone that can hear my voice, that your Holy Spirit right now would speak to them, convict them, encourage them, change them so that within their inner person they would long for you that no one would have to tell them and beg them to read your word and to pray to you but everything inside is like well what else would i want to do and who else would i rather speak to because your spirit is in them and you jealously yearn for the spirit you've placed in them God, would you do that? So that they would naturally long for holiness, that those who are in inappropriate relationships, I don't have to give a talk about it even right now, but that your spirit would gross them out, that they would realize that they're giving up holding your hand to hold some whore. That they're giving up looking into the eyes of Jesus to look at a screen of pornography and they would just be grossed out. that those who are living life for this earth would go, whoa, there's something so much bigger to live for. Oh, Father, would you please send your Holy Spirit to awaken them right now. In Jesus' name. Right before I came to Kansas City, I, uh, I was in Alaska for the first time. I actually went to Andy's hometown um, 
to meet the people he grew up with, to ask them if he's for real. Um, <laughs> no, he's kind of set me up with some of his friends. I said, I, and the reason why was I was like, hey, I looked at my kids. I've got seven kids, two grandkids. Um, so my oldest are like married and kids, and, but I still have like a couple teenagers, like a 10 or 11 year old, I don't remember. And, uh, <laughs> and a six-year-old, so I've got like still a lot of kids. And, uh, and I was just so burdened for my kids because I'm realizing one's gonna be a senior in high school, one's gonna be a junior, uh, my daughter and, and son, and I'm, I'm going, wow, I might only have a year left with them, and I'm looking at the world, where it's headed, where it is right now, and I'm thinking back to when I was in high school. I know you always hear this from old people, like, it wasn't like that in my day, you know? And it really wasn't. And even in raising my 25-year-old is totally, completely different than raising my six-year-old. He's growing up in a different world. And I'm realizing my, my teenagers, whom I love, that's when my life turned around. I'm going, gosh, you guys don't, you, you, your, your minds are so like going so fast be, be, because of this. And you, you, you I, I see it like it's so rare to find a teenager who can pray, who can be alone for, for 10 minutes and try to focus on God and not have their mind wander. Because this thing has just triggered us to constant stimulation. So you close your eyes to pray and there are just so many thoughts that go running through your mind. And it's just normal to you and you know nothing else. And I love my kids so much. Man, I am crazy about my kids. And I'm looking at my younger ones and go, God, I don't know if they're going to make it. I don't know if they know how to pray. I don't know if there's like this deep, I, like I remember as a high school student crying out to you and being focused and zoned in on you, but I didn't have this, we didn't have this. And I just told my kids, I go, I, I gotta do something because I just need to get you away because I love you guys so much. And so we're gonna go to Alaska and you're not allowed to take your cell phones. There, in fact, no screens whatsoever, no iPads, no television, no media, nothing. I go, you're gonna talk to me and we're gonna have a blast and we're gonna go out into nature and we're gonna go look at bears or walruses, whatever's there. I'd never been, you know, but we're going to do that. And I want you, because I go, you guys, I want you to know how to pray. If this is my last season on this earth, there's no guarantee. My dad died when I was 12. My mom died when I was born. I don't know when it's going to be the end for me. And I go, I'm looking at this world and I, I just love you guys and I want you to make it. And I, but you got to know how to pray. You've got to learn how to just connect. But you don't even know how to talk to people very well. Even when you talk, you're like, oh, oh yeah. It's like there's a way of connecting to another human being and there's a way of connecting to God that I, I just want you to taste it. I want you just to see that the real life, real relationships with human beings and God, like it's awesome. I tell you, you will not miss this by the end. You'll go through withdrawals, you might shake, you may it initially, but I'm telling you, you're gonna like it. I'm gonna make you like it. You're gonna, and it's been wonderful. It's been so good. In fact, when I left Alaska three days ago, you know, I met all these Alaskan, you know, fishermen, stuff like that. And I was like, hey, can I leave my son here? Can I throw him on a fishing boat? And because I hear you guys just work and never sleep. And 
like just for a couple of weeks. You don't even have to pay him. You know, <laughs> like I'll pay him after some whatever. I just want him to experience like hard work, like my generation grew up with, and all of your generation. You know, I, I just want him to experience life with people and nature and God. And so I left him there. And uh, he's on a boat somewhere on some ocean, the Arctic or whatever is up there. And you guys, I'm doing this because I love my kids. You know, seriously, I'm going, man, I, I, I'm just telling myself, we're texting. Now I said, okay, now you can use your phone, but only to text, you know, no entertainment, whatever. It's just kind of weird to have him on a boat in an ocean and I don't know where he is. So I said, well, we'll keep in touch. But you guys, I'm so excited um, about what God's gonna do in his life, what he's doing in my other children's lives and the rest of my family that's here in Kansas City because something is happening for this season. And what God has shown me is, this is why I'm so pumped up about the send and being a part of it, it is all about raising up the next generation of you guys. You know, seriously. You guys, I've been married 27 years and on my 25th anniversary, my wife looks at me at dinner and 25, and they're 25 years, she goes, do you know of anyone happier than us? Like on the entire earth. I go, no. And she goes, me neither. <laughs> and I go, I, she goes, I keep thinking I'll meet someone happier than us and I haven't found them. I go, me neither. Like, that's an amazing thing to hear on your 25-year anniversary, right? And really mean it to each other. And, and I want that. I want that. I, I want that for you. I want that for this generation. And, and God's been showing me that, that this last couple of weeks and really these last few years that this next season of my life is not about what Francis Chan is going to do. It is all about me becoming less and less and less and decreasing and helping to build up this next generation by, by telling you what, what, what will lead to life, which is what Jesus says. I came to bring you life. There's a thief who's gonna to try to steal your time. He's gonna to try to kill and destroy. He's, it's a thief who's robbing you of life. And Jesus, I came to give you life and life to the full. There's this, this life you can experience and I've been experiencing these last few days and I'm begging you, parents, man, there, there comes a point where you just let go of any dreams for yourself and you're okay, now it's time to build into this next generation and get them serious about. And one crazy thing, I was with a friend today that I haven't seen in forever and he lives here in Kansas City and uh, he was telling Andy and I, like he made a deal with his kids. I'm like, wow, I've never heard anything like this, but he's filthy rich so he can do it. But he said, uh, he said to his kids when they went into high school, because I heard you can drive earlier here, like 14 or something like that. And he goes, if you agree to just have a flip phone, I will buy you any car you want. He says, we'll go to Verizon right now, get a flip phone, and then we'll go to any car dealer and you can buy any car you want. But the moment you go to a smartphone, I'm taking the keys away and you're on your own. I'm like, dang, that's awesome. You know, I mean, and his daughter who was hesitant, he brought home like catalogs from Maserati, Lamborghini, going, you sure? Like, it's just, but this is, he's like, I don't know if I did the right thing, but I just don't want my kid doing this because it'll kill them, okay? And don't go looking at your parents going, why don't you do that? It, uh, but I, that's, that wasn't my point. My point was, there are some of us who are older 
and we can see what this is doing to you. There's this flow that is pulling you. It's just, it's so hard to go against it. And the worst part is, okay, I really believe that Jesus is coming soon. I really believe this. And we were talking about this today. See, when I was your age, I keep looking at you guys because you look like you're in high school. I hope you're, not you, sorry. <laughs> I can tell you're not. Okay, um, but uh, I mean, you'll probably look young for your age and great, but I, okay, but uh, what was I talking about? Darn it. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, I really believe the end is coming. And when I was your age, growing up in America, I did not think about things like the sand and spending my life on mission. I was scared of being a missionary. It just, it was for this small group of, of, of honestly, in my mind, strange people that, that, that maybe had no other thing to do. Because, because my generation, we were still obsessed with the American dream. And we were thinking, oh, I'm gonna have a big house. I'm gonna da 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 da. I know what I'll do. I'll be like a youth pastor or a pastor, and you know, and you know, get a bunch of fans, and you know, and, and then get a nice little thing if I'm gonna go into ministry at all, whatever. But the missionary thing, no. Because there was still this American dream thing. And what I love is I think you guys are growing up in a generation that knows, no, there's no such thing as the American dream. We don't even know if they'll be in America in 10 years. The way things are going, it is nuts. The world is insane. We don't know what is happening. It's going so fast that you're not dreaming of 50 years of stability, right? You're just thinking there's no such thing on the earth anymore. And, and it's just, I, I don't, you know, if I wanted to keep my kids safe, I don't even know where I'd send them. It's, the, the, it's so, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And, and there's a good thing about that, that you know you're going to just have to spend your life on something rather than yourself. If you're going to just try to preserve your life and save your life. See, in my generation, we were still thinking about saving our lives. But you're growing up in a generation that recognizes where the world is going and what's going on. I've never seen anything like it, what's happening in the world today and how fast everything is happening. And so you've got to decide, what am I going to do with my short time on earth? I have a purpose and I'm just going to fulfill it. And then I'm going to go home to heaven. And it is easier to think that way, despite all the craziness, there's an advantage. The world is so gross and crazy that you recognize this, this can't be my home. I can't make a home here, so let me spend it, let me be sent wherever you call me, God. But the only way you're gonna find that out is if you can understand 1 Peter 4, 7. It says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, you would think that if he says, hey, the world's going to end, the world's going to end, you'd think, okay, I better go do something. He goes, no, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. See, we usually think of prayer as a means to an end. Where I pray and go, God, I'm praying because I want this to happen. And, and, and that is part of prayer. But we think of, okay, I want, I, I'm going to pray so that this will happen. 
But that's not what this verse is saying. He says, the end of all things is at hand. And he says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The goal is a clear prayer life. Okay, it's the goal. It's not the means to an end. So that when Christ returns, because the end is coming, you want to be one of those young men, young women, that your mind is fixed on him. That you've shown, and that only happens if you have self-control. That you didn't watch 30 TikTok videos, or whatever you call them. Is it videos, TikTok? TikToks? Okay, sorry. Okay. (laughs) I, I'm not very woke. Okay, so you just go, I just watched 15 TikToks. Next time I give this talk, I'm gonna, you know, wow, that guy's cool. Um, we always say it wrong, old people. Um, and so you, but you don't have the self-control. Oh, everyone just watched that one. Everyone just saw this. Everything. I got, I got to see it. It's self-control. I said, I don't have to look at that. I don't want to go down to everyone else's level. I want to go up to his level. And I can't go to his level unless I have self-control so that I can be clear-minded so that I can actually pray. And then as I speak with God, He's going to give me direction for how I spend the remainder of this time. There's an old, I think it's African proverb or whatever. I don't even know it's a proverb. Whatever. There's, never mind. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> There's this thing. I don't even know what you call it. There's this old lesson like about these two candles. You ever heard about the big candle and the little candle? Um, but it, there's like this big candle and this small candle and it's like, okay, this is me and my son. And then you go, okay, you, most people assume the big candle is the dad and the little candle is the son, but no, that's not true. The little candle is me. I've burnt down to where there's just a little bit left. The stupidest thing for me to do is try to keep this flame alive. The best thing I can do with my life as that little candle that who knows how much longer this flame is going to burn is let me invest my life in lighting these full-grown candles that have their whole lives, whatever is left of this time on earth, and lighting those And begging you to be, if if my goal is not that just my light would shine bright, but that there would be a light on this earth that stays burning, then I need to invest whatever is left of me not holding up this shriveled little tiny candle and go, look at Francis Chan. (laughs) But for me to spend my days going, man, I want to light you on fire because you got your whole life in front of you. And I'm begging you, look, you guys, you're going to waste it if you're just obsessed with keeping up and doing what everyone else is doing. Look at everyone else's family. Look at everyone else's marriages. Look at everything else that's going. Is that really what you want? And I'm just telling you, from a grandfather's perspective, man, I've had a ridiculous life. And it has just gotten crazier in the last couple of days where I'm going, just when I thought, like I said, a couple years ago, my wife and I go, we're the happiest people on the earth. This week, I'm going, I don't even know what happiness was. I I didn't even get it. Like, I'm getting it. I, I mean, that doesn't come from going with the flow. And I'm telling you right now, There's a mission for you guys. And I saw so many of my friends miss it and stick with the dream rather than losing their life to truly find it. And I'm asking you who are older, 
Like maybe you did waste a lot of your years pursuing the same dream that many of us did back then. And at the very least, use what's left now to warn the generation, this generation against wasting their lives because you know some of us have some serious regrets. I go, I could have done so much more. That's a great message to give to the next generation. Don't feel the shame in it. Don't just, just let it go, okay? What's done is done. But knowing what we know about the future, let's protect this next generation and let's send them out and not be obsessed with them living a long, comfortable life on the earth because you and I know that's a myth given our day and age. And let's pray for a serious movement of young people who spend their lives well and have their minds focused on an eternal God. I wanna pray right now because I don't want this to be a speech. I don't want this to last for another five minutes where you think that was a good idea and then go back to the mud. I wanna pray that something is seriously lit in you, okay? That is of the Spirit. Father, thank you for opening some of our eyes. There is no time to screw around anymore and be lukewarm. There is no time for that anymore. God, may we learn that from COVID. May we learn that from all the things that are going on. Every time we look at the news, may we just see that it really feels like the end is near. And that's a great, great thing. God, I pray for this next generation that you would help them to be self-controlled and clear-minded so they can just stare at you in heaven. So that their ears can, their spiritual ears can hear what you are saying to them as individuals and what the purpose of their existence is. That you don't get swept away by all the noise of the world and where everyone else is going. Because your word says that wide and easy is the gate that leads to destruction. But difficult and narrow is the life, is, is the road that leads to life, and few will find it. I pray that some of the young people who hear my voice would truly be hearing your voice and walk that narrow and difficult road that leads to life. That your Holy Spirit would birth something in them right now so that they can't be talked out of it. because you sent your son to die for us. You are a good, holy, loving God. You are our treasure, and we cannot wait to spend eternity with you. It's gonna be outrageous, far beyond anything we've experienced on this earth. We trust your word, we believe it. Holy Spirit, please birth something. In Jesus' name.